I want to point your attention to Matthew chapter 10. Again, very familiar passage of Scripture, Matthew 10. Did I put it on there? I put it on there, didn't I? Matthew 10, beginning at verse number 34. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. This is Jesus speaking. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Psalm chapter 37, beginning at verse number 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord. He shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noon day. Something that I believe is going to bring us where we need to be in 2019 is commitment. And I want to preach this morning a message that I've entitled, There's a Blessing in Commitment. There's a Blessing in Commitment. Someone say amen to the reading of God's Word. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. There's a blessing in commitment. I read a story about a journalist who was assigned to the Jerusalem bureau of his newspaper, and he got an apartment that was overlooking the Wailing Wall. And after several weeks, he realized that whenever he looked at the wall, he saw an old Jewish man praying vigorously. You've seen pictures of that and video of that. And the journalist wondered whether there was a publishable story here. So he went down to the wall and he introduced himself and he said, I see that you come every day to the wall. He said, what are you praying for? The old man replied, what am I praying for? Well, in the morning I pray for world peace. Then I pray for the brotherhood of man. I go home, have a glass of tea, and I come back to the wall to pray for the eradic eradication of illness and disease from the earth. Now the journalist was taken by the old man's sincerity and persistence. You mean you have been coming to the wall to pray every day for these things? The old man replied, yes. How long have you been coming to the wall to pray for these things? The old man became reflective and then he replied, well, how long? Maybe 20, 25 years. The amazed journalist finally asked, how does it feel to come and pray every day for over 20 years for these things? How does it feel, the man replied? Feels like I'm talking to a wall. <laughs> I'm sure that praying to that wall got old. But I tell you what, he was committed. He was committed. There's a blessing in commitment. David wrote in Psalm 37, 4 and 5, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Commit your way to the Lord. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Commit your way to the Lord. The word commit is the root word of commitment. And the word commitment means the act of committing. It's pledging or engaging oneself. It is a pledge or a promise. It is an obligation. I read for you Matthew 10, 34 and 39. And in these verses, Jesus speaks about commitment to him. He's talking about loyalty. He's talking about allegiance to him. Jesus is talking about a dedication that is required for someone who walks with him. Verse 34 reads, Do not think that I come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Now on the surface, when you first start reading these, these words sound bad. Oh, what do you mean you've come to bring a sword? We might thought, I thought Jesus was the Prince of Peace. 
Why would he bring a sword? Or why would he be fighting? The point of the text is that we are, if we are truly committed followers of Jesus Christ, then we will be enemies of those in this world. Not enemies in hating, but we will be enemies of the things of this world. They will not be something that we embrace as friends. The ways of the world will not be something that we embrace as something that's acceptable. Some people will not like us because of our faith. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some people don't like do-gooders. Some people don't like Christian people of any time. Oh, you're just one of those Christians. I'm, I'm going to avoid you. I've had it happen to me. I'm sure you've had it happen to you. After all, didn't the people of Jesus' day crucify him? Why would be we be no better or no worse than Jesus? How can we expect different treatment in our world today if we exclaim, if we promote that we are a follower of Jesus Christ? Verses 35 and 36 read, For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Jesus did not purposely come to cause trouble in a people's house. That was not his goal. But if a person makes a strong commitment to Jesus Christ, it may cause some trouble or it may cause some division in your house. I experienced that growing up. My father was not a, at that point, he wasn't a churchgoer and he wasn't a Christian. Um, he was a Marine, a diehard Marine, and he was all Marine. And, and he just didn't understand why I went to church three times a week, four times really at that point, Monday, for, uh, Wednesday, Friday, two times on Sunday. He didn't understand why I went to church four times a week. And so there were times that we did not see eye to eye on things. So if you're truly a child of God, and you've made a strong commitment, there's going to be some time that there's going to be some trouble. Or there's going to be some division in your home. We've heard stories about Orthodox Jews who have decided that, uh, that the Bible is correct and they've accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And what will happen in those cases many times if they're truly Orthodox Jew family, they will disown that person. They will say, well, that's fine. You're just not one of us anymore. Verse 37, Jesus starts to bring the focus of what is the meat of this passage. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Jesus didn't say that we couldn't or shouldn't love our family members. In fact, you should love your family members, regardless if they don't agree with, agree with you about your walk with God. Don't show yourself. Love them. Amen. Love them. Love your family members. He was just saying that if the choice would be to love your family members more than him, there is no choice. You love him. And really when we consider everything that he's done for us and will do for us, that's really not asking too much, is it? For us to love him most of all. True commitment to Christ means that we will love him most of all and put him first over all. Amen. Thank you for that amen, Brother Corey. <laughs> I heard someone say yes over here. Probably it was Kelsey because she talked a little bit about that this morning, talked about foundation. Your foundation is in video games. Your foundation is in television programs. Your foundation is in things of the world that's not going to stand. A true, committed child of God is going to put him first over everything. True commitment to Jesus means that we will love him most of all and put him over all. I read a story about um, the Missionary Society wrote to a gentleman named David Livingstone who was a missionary to Africa in 1813 and he was there for 60 years. And asked, they asked him, have you found a good road to where you are? If so, we want to know how to send other men to join you. Well, Livingstone wrote back and he said, if you have men who will come only if they know that there is a good road, he said, I don't want them. I want men who will come if there is no road at all. That's a statement about commitment. And that's how we should view our walk with God. Even if I don't understand the road that I'm on, I know that He's going to light my path and light my way. 
In our Bible study this past Wednesday night, I talked about commitment. I talked about how that in the book of Nehemiah, in the Old Testament, we read about how the children of Israel rebuilt the broken down walls around Jerusalem, and they did it in just 52 days. And Nehemiah told us how they were able to overcome every obstacle. He told us how they were able to overcome everything that stood in their way to get the job done. Nehemiah 4 and 6 reads like this, So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height. And here's the reason why, for the people had a mind to work. Rebuilding that wall got done, not because of tremendous leadership. Rebuilding that wall got done not because of tremendous talent. Not because of all the circumstances were just right. This is okay and that's okay so what will happen? You know they ran into problems. That wall was rebuilt because the people had a mind or they were committed to get the work done. I truly believe that 2019 holds great things for us. I believe that. I believe 2019 is going to be a banner year. But if we are going to see great things in 2019, both as a church family and in our individual families and in our individual lives, then all of us have a part to play. All of us have a part to play. I told them Wednesday night that I feel so passionate about God desiring us all to pray, to raise our commitment level in 2019 that I would probably talk about it this morning. So here I am. I'm going to preach about it a little bit this morning. A strong personal commitment to God and to His purpose and to His work is something that is quickly disappearing from the modern day church. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, a theme that carries throughout the Bible is a requirement by God that those who call themselves one of His will be committed to Him. Amen. Deuteronomy 4 verses uh, 23 and 24. Take heed to yourselves lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God which He made with you and made for, for yourselves a carved image in the form of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you. For your God, the Lord your God is a consuming fire. He is a jealous God. God forbids anything that comes between us and our walk with Him. I said that God forbids anything that comes between us and our walk with Him. I read it for you in Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 and 38. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Anything, hear me now, anything that comes between us and our walk with God is proof that we are truly not committed to the Lord. Anything that comes between us and our walk with God is proof. You can put your finger on it and you can say, that is keeping me from a total commitment to God. Total commitment to the Lord is a requirement that was in place in the Old Testament and it's a requirement that's in place in the New Testament and still in place for this church, Harvest Christian Ministries in 2019. Praise God. God requires commitment from His children. But commitment to God and His work and His purpose is disappearing from the modern day church. Real commitment to God by Christians is eroding. Real commitment to God by Christians is being eaten away like a cancer when it attacks the cells in a human body. It will eat away at those good and healthy cells and it will leave behind tumors that invade and attack and if it's left undealt with, will eventually take the life of the one who has it. That's what will happen to a Christian. The fleshly man and a Christian will attack the spiritual man like a cancer, slowly eating away at the commitment level to God, replacing it with things that are not healthy until eventually, if it's left undealt with, it will destroy their walk with God. 
Let me share with you this morning a few commitment areas where the fleshly man is attacking the church. A 2014 Pew Research Center study reports that 67% of Protestant Christians, that's us, we're Protestant Christians, we're in that category. 67% of Protestant Christians admit that they do not attend a religious service at least once per week. And I believe that that percentage would even be even more horrible if the question were asked about Christians, those who are believers, those who profess a walk with God, Christians who would admit that they don't attend a religious service twice per week. When I, some of you men can relate to this, I knew that I wanted Patty to be my wife way before she knew. <laughs> Amen. In fact, she tried to convince me she didn't. No, I'm just kidding, she didn't. <laughs> but I lived in Jacksonville, and she lived in Durham, and she was a part of a very, uh, a, a, a growing church, and a church that had a lot of things going on. So I would drive up on a Saturday morning, me and a buddy of mine, he was dating Patty's sister at that time, and he, me and a buddy of mine would leave early on a Saturday morning from Jacksonville, and we'd drive to Durham, and we'd get up with them, and, and we would not go out and have a picnic, we would not go out and and spend time together holding hands and looking lovingly into each other's eyes. No, we went and did bus ministry. That's what we did. She had a route that she went and visited every youngin on that route. And we did that. We started, I think, about 10 o'clock on Saturday mornings. And we generally finished up about 2 o'clock, about four hours of going on bus ministry. And then we'd go get a bite to eat and go back to the, her house. And we'd all change clothes and we'd go back to the church and we would have uh, some type of choir practice or something. Choir practice. At that time, when I moved to Durham, it was uh, other things too. But you understand now, I came to see her. I didn't come to do bus ministry. I didn't come to do choir practice. So we'd go and we'd have to be back at the church at about 6 o'clock for choir practice. And then at 7.30, we had a Saturday night service. And it lasted a couple hours, so that would be 9.30, about 10 o'clock. We would go to a restaurant, Patty and I and, and Terry and, and, and um, Tim and the rest of the young people. We'd go to a restaurant. We'd spend a few hours doing that. Christy remembers this. Kenneth remembers this. We'd go a few hours do that. And by about 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning, I would drive home. And then Sunday morning, I'd get up and go to church. And Sunday night, I'd get up and go to church. And then Wednesday, I'd go to Bible study. And then Friday, I had my youth service. You said, man, that's a lot of doing things for God. It was. But what's happening today is that's going away. That's not happening anymore. It's like a cancer that's eaten at those that love God the devil is putting so many other things in our way. And I'm not saying that was good because that was too much. You got me? That was too much. It wasn't time for family. That was too much. But when 67% of those that call themselves Christians will admit that they do not attend a, re a religious service at least once per week, there is something wrong. Hebrews 10 and 24 reads like this. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Paul the apostle was admonishing believers, he said, to commit yourselves to gathering for worship. Because there is a blessing in that commitment. It is a way that we rekindle. It is a way that we stir up our love for God. It is a way that we rekindle. It is a way that we stir up our love for each other. It is a way that we encourage each other to do good works that the Lord desires us to do. Let me tell you something. Church commitment, commitment to church attendance is being eaten away like a cancer. 
I challenge the children of God who call themselves members of Harvest Christian Ministries to not allow every little thing to keep you out of church. If you're sick, stay home. If you're contagious, for God's sake, stay home. I told him Wednesday night, I don't want your pink eye, I don't want your flu, I don't want your kid's pink eye, I don't want your kid's flu. But if every little thing, if your big toe aches tonight so you can't come to church, your big toe could ache sitting on this chair as good as it could ache sitting on that chair at home watching television. Someone say amen right there. Praise God. Whoo, I felt the Holy Ghost right there. In 2019, I challenge us to recommit ourselves to church attendance. Someone say amen. amen. There's a blessing in commitment. Another commitment area where the fleshly man is attracting the, attacking the church is in our financial giving to the work of God. Oh, no, he's not going to talk about that, is he? I told him Wednesday night, I talked about this a little bit Wednesday night. I hate to talk about this, but it's a necessary subject. If it's going to be talked about, it has to be talked about by me. A 2018 report issued by an organization named Nonprofit Source says that tithers only make up 10 to 25% of any congregation. It's only 10 to 25% of a congregation, whether it's a congregation of 30 or it's a congregation of 300, on average pay tithes. They state further that religious giving at all is down about 50% since 1990. I told you I'm talking about commitment levels in the church that are eroding away, that are being eaten away like a cancer. They state further that on average, Christians, not non-believers, but blood-bought, born-again Christians, on average, only give about 2% of their income. Exactly. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Is that Levi? Thank you, Levi. Push his toy back to him so he don't have to. It's right here in the front. Uh oh. That's what I say too. Uh oh. Dollar used to be a lot of money in the United States, didn't it? You could buy a lot. Used to be, even when Mike was a kid, you could buy a lot with a dollar. <laughs> hey, when I was a kid, you could buy a soda for about 20 cents, right? Y'all remember that? Can you buy a soda right now for a dollar? No. But yet this same dollar to some people is a huge amount of money when it goes in the offering plate. I was in a church service one time. I won't won't do this. I was in church service one time when the preacher was taking the offering. And he said, I want everyone to hold up your offering to God right now. Hold it up to God. And he said, I want you to look at that offering. I want you to say, God, you mean this much to me. Oops. Two mm. percent on average. Now, and I, now to me, and I don't know if, to you, if this is going to affect you the way it did me, but to me, this next statistic really drove home the point of how our modern day church is eroding in our giving to the work of God. Do you know what that number was during the Great Depression? I mean, nobody, I, I don't remember the Great Depression, but we know about it, right? We know what happened. Stock market fell and everyone, people was running, jumping out of windows and people couldn't find work. They couldn't eat. They couldn't, you know, the Great Depression. During the Great Depression, Christians gave on average 3.3% of their income. So between the Great Depression and where they were in 2014 when this study was, was, uh, was put together, you might say, well, that's not a 1.3% is not a lot. Well, 3.3% is not a lot on the top, but those folks seem to find a way to give to the house of God more 
than we are giving today who are so blessed. I could give you more statistics that prove that the fleshly man is, is attacking the children of God and our financial giving to the work of God. But rather than do that, let me just tell you what the Bible says about the blessings. I'm talking about there's a blessing in commitment. So let me tell you what the Bible says about the blessings that come when a child of God is committed to God. Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 10, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out of you of such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. What was that song you sang for offering? Give, Give, and it will come back to you. Press down, shaken together. Exactly. How about what, how about you say, well, you say, Pastor, come on now. <laughs> Pastor, that's Old Testament. We are in the New Testament. We, we, we just use the Old Testament for reference. I, I'm, in the New, I'm a New Testament Christian. Well, I'm so glad you are. How about the words of Jesus? Would that, would that suffice you? I want to tell you what Jesus was talking about in Luke chapter 6, verse number 38. Give, here we go, and it will be given to you Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. Now, now this is the part. We don't put this in the song because this next part really hits home. For the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. You can't get any more, Testament, any more New Testament than the words of Jesus. Someone say amen. Amen. I could give you more scripture, but let me just leave it with what Jesus said. Jesus said that with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. In other words, when you decide to act upon your financial commitment to God, the same measure that you used will be used to come up, that you use to come up with the amount that you give will be the same measure that God will use in giving you blessings. I, I, that's not me. They want, they want to understand, that's not my teaching. That's what Jesus said. That's not what Brother Rusty said. That's what Jesus said. Christian commitment to financial support of the church is being eaten away like a cancer. And I challenge the children of God who call themselves members of Harvest Christian Ministries to consider your commitment level to financial support of the work of God. In 2019, I'm challenging us all to recommit ourselves. Someone say amen. amen. Praise God. Whew, done with that. <laughs> Last Sunday, I hope that we all committed to reading the entire New Testament by the end of 2019. Let me tell you something. There is a blessing to committing ourselves to reading and to studying God's word. Someone say amen. Besides reading our Bible, communicating with God on a personal level through prayer is the thing that's going to help us to be successful in our walk with God. I could give you many, many, many scripture about prayer, but if there's one thing that is a given in a Christian's life that a Christian should just know that they should do, it is to be committed to prayer. It is to be committed to communication with their God. And I challenge all of us in this new year to raise our level of commitment to God and our commitment to personal communication with the Lord, our commitment to personal prayer. Someone say amen. amen. Sunday morning cannot be the only time that you pray. Right. Praise God. Now I did this on Wednesday night, so let me do this again. I want to speak to everyone in this house today who is an office holder in our church. If you hold some type of office in this church, I want to talk to you right now. I got your attention now, some of you who are here Wednesday night. Oh, what are you going to say now? What are you going to say to that Brother Billy Hollowell? I know he's a preacher in this church. What are you going to say to him? Well, here's who I'm talking to. I want to talk to the pastor. I want to talk to the Wednesday night Bible teacher. I want to talk to the kids' jam teacher. I want to talk to the manna teacher. I want to talk to, to the musician, to the singer. I want to talk to our greeter who we're close to getting. I want to talk to our IT worker. I want to talk to the person who, play, who prays to open and close the service. I want to talk to our ladies' department leader. I want to talk to our men's department leader. I want to talk to our youth leaders. I want to talk to our music director. I want to talk to... 
Those who break down our coffee station, I want to talk to those who plan and implement times where we serve food. I want to talk to those who help us clean up. I want to talk to those who help us cover these instruments after church. I want to talk to those who turn off the lamps after church. I want to talk to those who send out birthday cards. I want to talk to those who help us by emptying the toilet. I want to talk to those who are leaders in the congregation during our worship service. I want to talk to those who testify. Pastor, I thought you said office holders. You just mentioned everybody in the church. I'll tell you like I told them Wednesday night, good, you got my point. Everyone serves as a leader. Everyone in this church is an office holder in one capacity or another. At Harvest Christian Ministries, there are not now nor as long as I'm still trying to pastor this church will there ever be no big eyes or little U's in this church. We're all striving to the, to the work of God and the will of God. And in 2019, I'm challenging all of the office holders of this church, everyone. If you were somewhere in that list that I mentioned there, and if somehow I didn't plug into what your office is, know that I just missed it. But I'm challenging all of the office holders in this church to raise our level of commitment to God and our commitment to whatever we serve in. Someone say amen. amen. Colossians 3, 23 and 24 reads like this, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance for ye serve the Lord Christ. Galatians 6 and 9 reads, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall weep, weep if we faint not. The scripture is clear. God sees our commitment. God rewards us for our level of commitment, Paul wrote, and let us not be weary in well-doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. God sees your level of commitment. God sees my level of commitment. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm just going to be totally transparent. And I'm not going to try to lie to you this morning. There are times when I look at my level of commitment and I fall on my face before God right here in this building. And I say, God, forgive me. Because I'm not as committed as I should be. If we want a solid walk with God in 2019, if we want to be blessed in our walk with God in 2019, if we want to grow in our walk with God in 2019, if we want Harvest Christian Ministries as a church to grow in 2019, then we all, from this pulpit to those sitting in our sound room, all of us must have a willingness to commit to God and to his work and to his purpose. Because there is a blessing in commitment. Let's give the Lord some praise right now. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, come on, let's praise the Lord just a little bit right now. Hallelujah. I'm almost done. As your pastor, listen, listen, listen to me. I went longer than I meant to today, but I'm telling you God's in this message. As a pastor, as your pastor. I want you to have everything that God has for you. I, I, I wish that everyone in here would, would buy, would someone would give them a dollar ticket and they'd win the lottery. I wish everyone in here could have everything that they need. I pray for that. And as your pastor, I believe that God's word is true. And God's word teaches that receiving all of the benefits that God has for us beyond our salvation starts with our level of commitment. Right. I want to make sure that you understood that. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about the things that you need from God. It starts with our level of commitment. The apostle Paul wrote in Hebrews chapter 6 verses 9 and 10. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany. Notice, things that accompany salvation. Though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work of labor and love which you have shown toward his name in that you have ministered to the lost, to the saints. 
and to minister. Sorry, I don't know why that didn't happen. Paul wrote that our God is not unjust to forget our work. God is not unjust to forget our labors. God does not forget our commitments that we make and keep for his work. Someone say amen. amen. I'll close. That's two awesome words when a preacher's preaching and I'll close. Those are words we like to hear. I'm not, I didn't, as far as I didn't hear Levi say, praise the Lord. <laughs> he tried probably. Kenley's trying. But I'll close with one very familiar scripture from Psalm 103. And no one, and one that not so well-known scripture from the chapter. So you know this one, Psalm 103 and verse number two. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. How many know that scripture? How many have quoted that scripture? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Psalm 103 is a chapter that talks about the blessings of the Lord and the mercies of the Lord and the things that God has the power to do. Psalms 103, read it and it will bless you. But toward the end of that same chapter, David writes something that is a qualifier to all that he wrote earlier about what God can do. Notice verses 17 and 18. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. We'll preach about that one day. To such as keep, notice now, all of the things he wrote before, is it not in there? Oh, sorry. To all the things that he wrote about, God is a blesser. The Lord will meet our needs. If I had it up there, I'll read it to you. I'll read it slow. To such as keep his covenant. And to those, notice now, oh, and to those who remember his commandments to do them. You want the blessings? This is expected of you. Amen. To such as keep his covenant and to those who remember his commandments to do them, God commands that his children be committed. He commands that we be committed in our walk with God. Praise God. Praise God. I believe that 2019 holds great things for us. I really do. But if we want to see great things in 2019, then we all have a part to play. And that part starts with commitment. I challenge you today. I challenge myself today to raise our commitment levels. Let's make church attendance a priority. Let's make giving to the kingdom of God a priority. Don't give more than, you, than you're able to give. But for goodness sakes, don't not give because there's a blessing attached to that. Make prayer a priority. Make Bible reading a priority. Make your participation in the worship service a priority. Make leading your family in righteousness and in holiness a priority. Make reaching the lost a priority. In 2019, let's see what God will do for us individually and what God will do for your family and what God will do for us as a whole. Someone say amen. amen. Let's stand right now and worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's stand right now and worship the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I tell you what I'm going to do this morning. I'm going to open this altar. And if you're not where you need to be with God, if you know that things are not the way they should be, your first commitment is your walk with God. That's your first commitment. And if you're not where you need to be with the Lord, I encourage you this morning when we come to the front, come to this altar, kneel or stand and pray and ask the Lord to forgive you and get where you need to be with God. If things are okay with you and the Lord and your soul, but your commitment levels are just not where they need to be, you know, well, I could be doing this, but I'm not. Well, I could be giving this, but I'm not. Well, I could be praying more, but I'm not. I could be reading my Bible more, but I'm not. If that paints a picture of where you are today, I invite you to come and pray and ask the Lord to help you and recommit yourself to his work and to his purpose. Regardless of where you are with God, I'm asking everyone to come. And let's thank God for his blessings. And let's commit ourselves anew to him. Someone say amen.
If we want to see God do great things in 2019, let's everyone come together and pray. Let's come right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.